the emotion that comes out of me is it's like a whirlwind it's like a sort of tornado two of us talk so much this could go on for days are there any uh misperceptions about you personally that you feel how people have the wrong notion about how you are as an artist and a person yeah but, uh, like you when you first met me what did you think of me we'll get into that we'll touch upon that <laughs> i'm gonna have to ask a question what do i think about you now i mean i'm just a, no, I'm a mercenary no, it doesn't <laughs> no but but yeah I, I mean i got i think i this also really upset me because back in the 90s i was just considered to be a sort of loud mouth screaming girl <laughs> shouting about and and you know all this kind of thing um and also back in the 90s i was kind of like young and sort of sassy and and people didn't expect me to, and also because the way that i speak my accent and everything people didn't expect me somehow to have a brain i don't know why they thought woman with tits no brain and and this caused me a lot of problems and it's brilliant if you read a lot of the reviews that i had in the 90s and the early noughties and um, lots of these lots of these critics refer to my breast a lot of the women refer to my the way i speak they kind of t t um, do a kind of piss take of the way that i speak and, and quoting me and things it's just really not allowed it's not on you know i don't mind them criticizing my work but not what i was born with my voice and not my background either which is another thing and and you know I was really treated, I think, with the, by the critics quite unfairly, and they would never do that now. They would ne it would be, especially after Me Too and all of these things, ever. Yeah, so, we live in a different world, which is a good yeah. thing, in a lot of ways, obviously. Um, okay, to dig a little deeper, personally, you were a little bit under the weather this summer, so to speak. So, um, I'm right smack in the middle of having COVID right now, which is a great way to hedge myself. And in case I'm really terrible at interviewing you, I could just blame COVID and the mm -hmm. fact that I have a terrible headache and a chest ache. But I can't complain because you were a little bit, uh, you had a little bit of a thing this summer. Anything you want to talk about in relationship to that? Yeah, well, everyone says to me, how was your COVID? No, no how was my cancer? So I am, um, yeah, I was, I was on my roof. So first of all, with COVID, um, it was shocking what's happened, the amount of people that died, the way the governments have dealt with it is appalling and awful. So I'm totally aware of that. So what I'm going to say is just from my own personal thing, I actually really enjoyed the lockdown. I was very, very happy. I didn't hardly see anybody for 11 weeks. And I was really happy up on and my house here. So uh, my house is built in 1729 and it's very thin. It's, it's all metal wood. And on the top, there's a mansard roof, very Mary Poppins. And we had this amazing weather at the beginning of lockdown. It was like phenomenal, 90 degrees, 80 degrees. And I sunbathed in the, in the top of the roof in between the slates and, and I was so happy and I was, there was, and all the birds were flying around and the, um, you know, there was no planes in the sky it was, and the sky was blue and everything just looked beautiful and like wonderful, except I had this sort of slight pain and then I sort of had this slight amount of blood in the, in the loo and stuff like that. And actually I catheterized. So actually I had the blood at the end of the catheter to be really honest. And I thought this isn't good. So um, I rang up the lady urogynecologist that I see. And luckily because of COVID, she was free and she could see me like the next day and I went. And then she, when she examined me, she sort of said, oh dear, kind of, and I could see behind her mask. She was sort of like, looked really anxious. And, um, I asked her what it was and she said she didn't know. And then she sent me for an MRI scan straight away. And I went back to my studio and I was gonna drive down to Margate. And when I got to my studio, I didn't, I opened up a bottle of champagne and poured myself a glass of champagne and sat looking at this painting that I'd made that was unfinished, but I didn't understand what it was. Usually with a painting, I know where it's gonna go or I understand what, 
that I'm going to paint all over it or something. But this painting, I did not know what it was. And I knew it was something, but I was staring and staring and staring at it. And my phone rang. Oh, yeah. And also, because I drank the glass of champagne, I was angry with myself because it meant I couldn't drive. So I just sat there staring for hours at this painting. The phone rang. It was about seven o'clock in the evening. And it was the Eurogynecologist. And she said to me, are you... Are you okay, Tracy? Are you with anybody and whatever? And I said, no, I'm just sitting in my studio. And I said, what is it? I said, it's bad news. And she said, yeah. She said, you've got cancer. And the kind of cancer that I, I had, got, had, was a squamous cell cancer. And I had a big tumour in my bladder. And it meant, because the cancer was so aggressive and so rapid, that they couldn't just... Um couldn't just remove the tumor so they had to remove my within three weeks they removed my bladder my urethra my uh, a full hysterectomy my lymph nodes and half of my vagina and sewed it up so that was kind of my summer really and um it was like the straight all happened within a month so it's kind of shocking and strange. And, and the reason why there was all of that is because I couldn't have any chemotherapy or radiotherapy because the cancer was too rapid. And so then I spent five days not knowing if the surgery had worked or if I was going to make it. And if I wasn't going to make it, I knew that I wasn't going to make it till Christmas. So it was kind of like a lot of state, really. And I ended up where, with a, a, a urostomy bag for my bladder. So I've got a bag now. And um, that's okay, better than death. So, um, but it's, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I, it was enlightening for me. It's been amazing. I've actually be, definitely become a better person. People say this stuff, but I have become a better person for it. I, my mum died of the same cancer, same bladder cancer. And my mum had so much humility and so much grace. I mean, phenomenal. And when she was dying, I thought, well, I, well, actually, the only time she didn't have any grace is when she was dying. She fought it really, really hard. But I, all the time I thought, God, you know, if, if I was dying, I wish I had grace like that. I wish I could do it like that. And um, Just think one thing, to cut you off for a second. You, yeah, go you go, you're worse than me for going on. I don't know. You, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm almost crying because having been close friends with you over the past year or so, half a year, um, almost a year, I just have never met someone as courageous as you, honestly. And I think everyone has experienced cancer in their family. I lost my mother to cancer. And like, as I sit here ill myself and so many, I don't know, I just think it's been the most incredible thing to see how strong and fierce you are during the course of your fight with this. And you're, it's incredible to watch you and to know you. Well, one thing that was really interesting, as soon as I knew what, and, and I saw a film, I saw a film of the actual cancer and it was so horrible. I said, it looked like a clown. It was yellow and white with bits of red and splashes of blue veins. It's not at all what I imagined cancer would look like. It was so scary. It was so frightening. And like, this actually become my enemy. And this is what I had to fight. I sorted all that out in my head. And then I wrote to all my friends, one big red round robin email telling them what had happened that I had like quite serious cancer and that they were not to contact me which was one of the most sensible things i did because i realized that i couldn't cope with answering everybody's questions and all that kind of thing so it was kind of quite strange as well because of the covid when i was in hospital i was in hospital on my own going through all this which was quite strange as well but i really enjoyed it i enjoyed that those that that you know 10 days in hospital just sinking on morphine. <laughs> I liked all of it until the dead people came through the wall for me. That was the only really scary bit. But it well, was an experience. You scared them away. <laughs> you fought them off nobly, yeah. I must say. Yeah, I did. The it's nurse funny, said, oh, when, yeah. As you were texting me one day, I received another text simultaneously that I was not to write to you as you were in the middle of writing to me. So I broke the rules. I'm sorry. Um, you, you're just but, fearless. Or you must have been scared. Stop, stop. Can I say to Xavier? It's really good. So Xavier was doing this thing because of lockdown where, where, he, where his artists were asked three questions. 
and we had to answer these three questions what are you reading what are you doing where are you at the moment or whatever and i did it and sent it off to xavier and he's going oh min what is this is this some kind of acting or what your, your acting is phenomenal why are you being like this this is like and it's because i i had full-blown cancer xavier that's why and i didn't know at the time and i'd been ill in bed for about three weeks honestly just getting more and more unwell <laughs> And thinking it was a hangover, you know. But a <coughs> so, um, so if you go back to if you go to Xavier Hopkins site and see that bit of film of me talking, answering three questions, you'll see what someone looks like with full blown bladder cancer. And it's kind of uh, lots of dark rings. Yeah. Amazing. Sorry, it's gone. Okay. Well, I mean, were you you must have been scared or petrified at some point, but you never really showed it to anyone. Amazing. No, I wasn't. I wasn't scared. Okay, I wasn't. Forget all that bullshit. No, no, I wasn't because I had to get on with it. I had no choice. I, if if I was going to sit around and be scared, then it would mean that I was going to like give up or something. So I just had, <coughs> I was completely opened myself up to death. Totally embraced that. So here I go. Hello, mum. Hello, dad. Kind of thing. Hello, docket. Come on. Kind of thing and then relax with all of that and that meant that i could concentrate on life and that's what i did to the best to the fullest i think i've ever done in my life and i'd never been so happy so there you go it worked okay my turn <laughs> you've certainly lived uh more than a few lives so far it seems and um well i guess the incredible thing is you have an amazing museum show that opens at the Royal Academy in less than a week, for Christ's sakes. You open this show in two of Xavier's galleries, which is insane. How on earth did you manage to get so much work done in advance? Do you, do you work on a deadline? Do you need a deadline? Obviously not, because you just, you made an incredible amount of work. And it's amazing because you were sick in June. And here we are six months later, and you're filling these spaces with the most incredible work I've ever seen you make, in my estimation, humbly, among the best, let's say. Um, it's because I work when I feel like it, when I feel the emotion, and I don't work when I don't feel like it. So I don't make myself do things because I've got a show. I do what I feel that I need to do, and it's quite good at the moment. I don't feel that I need to do anything, which is really good because I'm not supposed to. No. You need to get straight. I've done it all. And subconscious, I did it all. I did it. I worked so hard last year, really hard. I just didn't stop painting at the weekends in London, in France. It was like I loved it. I was totally absorbed and saturated in what I was doing. I, I it was so fantastic. And I learned a lot. But right now, I feel like this this moment is. I wanted to have a sabbatical this year. I planned to. Because I thought I was going to do the moon show last year, everything last year, but everything delayed. And I planned, and I am doing a sabbatical of sorts, just happened to be recovering from this, from cancer. But it's brilliant because I'm not making it work. Some kind of sabbatical, which yeah. four but simultaneous it's... shows on the Yeah, but I'm, yeah, but that's, if I can explain, that's not work work. That's not me. That's not this. It's not this or my heart. It, it's that, that's what happens afterwards. It's not the journey of me making the work itself. That's a different feeling. That's a different thing. And the other thing as well, when I'm painting, I'm doing it really properly. The emotion that comes out of me is it's like a whirlwind. It's like a sort of tornado, like a hurricane. And every time before I start a painting, it's like I can feel the fear inside me. I don't know what's going to happen. It's almost like summoning up gods or poltergeist or whatever. It feels like I'm, it, I'm bring, yeah, going into another world or something. So um, at the moment, that's not good for me because I might just slip into the other side and I don't want to at the moment. No, you're not going to. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to change gears. And this here, if you could see, is a headline from a newspaper back in 2012. And can you see? Yes, Great Dancer. Party, great girl, dance, sends party girl sends M and Art flying. So just yes. to talk about our funny little peculiar history of our relationship, we kind of used to hate each other's guts. 
And I had curated a show with my kids in London back in 2012. And you were so kind enough to let us visit your studio. And it was a, a collection of artwork that I own, as well as a group of artworks from my family, from my kids and their friends. And one of your pieces, while there was a band playing, was knocked over. And thankfully, the piece was bronze and it survived unscathed. But a little glass box that housed it was broken. And somehow it ended up in everywhere from the BBC radio to the Pakistan daily newspaper <laughs> that me and my kids were negligent and irresponsible Philistines knocking over the Tracy Emin. And that was not the most fortuitous way to start a friendship and a relationship. And you were kind of slagging me off across the globe. And I may have done the same thing, made a few artworks about you. But anyway, there's, wait, wait, no, let me finish. <laughs> I'm not done. So anyway, then I bumped into you in London with Xavier at a hotel last October. And I always say that if any, anyone can get in touch with me over Instagram, I love Instagram. And every single person that DMs me, I always immediately get back in touch. And I'm very amenable to trying to help people and have a dialogue with people. And just last Christmas, I began to have a, a conversation with somebody over Instagram, which carried on for about 10 days before I realized that it was you. And since then, we've become fast friends and I absolutely, I adore you so much. And it's such a gift just to know you. I don't want to get all emotional again. So there's actually a question. Uh, what do you think of social media? Do you use it? Do you like it? Are you inspired by it? Do you like Instagram? What are your feelings about that? Um, about well, I, like, I like Instagram because I think it's like a little community. And, I, and, the, and you have friends on it and people and it, it opens up like loads, like I really like lots of ancient Egyptian things, Byzantine art, Byzantine fresco. That's, you know, all, all the things I look at are historic, most of them. And um, I only, I don't have people because of the grand scheme of things. It's very private. Um, but I don't any social media. I've never done Facebook. I don't even know how to do it. I'm a real Luddite, actually. I'm not very technical and I'm not very a century in lots of ways. I prefer to be your internet connection is unstable. No, that's okay. Anyway, yeah. I prefer to be, um, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> um, no, I prefer to be, I'd rather go to a seance than go on Facebook any day. He was calling you unstable. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it's the thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on. So Tell you like Instagram? Me. I like Instagram, that's, that's about it, but I don't like the amount of trolling and cruelty and viciousness there is with all social media. I just think it should be a criminal offence. I just think it's, it's terrible, really terrible. And, yeah. um, and I think for a younger generation, it's really very, very harmful, actually. So, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, like life, there's, it's a bell's curve of humanity and morality and there's extraordinary things that can unfold and relationships like ours that could be forged through something so simple. And at the same time, the worst part of people tend to come to the surface because there's no, there's, it's like judge and jury online and it could be very hurtful. Well, part of that, well it's really because it's, it's, always, it's a new world, isn't it? And within that new world, there's no parameters or rules. There are no judges, there are no ju It's a new world that's being created that doesn't make sense if we have the same uh, jurisdictions that was in our, in our living world. It's like a world within the ether. So how do we control that? Who gets trolled more? You and I must be among the two people that get hated upon more than, I mean, tell us about, it's so weird because like, I just think you're such an open, honest person and I consider myself to be transparent as well. And you would think that these types of qualities would be embraced in people and our community in the art world. And yet the attacks are ruthless and so mean, spirited. This is ridiculous. 
this is really good. I did um during lockdown. I did a diary thing for White Cube. So you do it. You I, you do you put um post up every day or whatever. And and uh, <laughs> by day three, the trolling was so bad and so nasty. So I called up White Cube and I said, you know what? I don't think I'll do it tomorrow. It's like so nasty. And they sort of said, well, don't read the comments. I went, oh come on. Of course I'm going. You know, and. And it was so bad. And then there was one comment and it said, I can't believe White Cube that you took down my comment. I'm entitled to freedom of speech and say what I want. So I said to White Cube, why did you take the person's comment down? And they said, because it, they said, because it was so nasty. And I said, yeah, I know, but leave it up. And then it shows what a really nasty person they are. And they said, we couldn't. And I said, why not? And they said, we had so many that call you a cunt. It just wouldn't, it was just really terrible. So we took them all down. And I was thinking, Christ, you know, and I said, how many? A lot. So someone goes on an art to an art gallery and decide to call me, it doesn't, it's just kind of, well, cunt is one of my favorite words, so I'll take it as a good thing. But why do you think you elicit such a response in people? Because so I always have. I always have. Doesn't matter what I do, what I say, I, I always have. There's people, a lot of people really dislike me. They've never met me, for example. A lot of people think my work's crap. They've never seen it. A lot of people think I'm a foul-mouthed kind of in the best whatever. Way. They've never spoken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Horrible in the best People don't know me. People and the, and what is good good for me is when people get to know me and they change their opinion. It's quite it's nice. It's pleasant for me, but I'm used to it. So well, I have to say, but, I, even, um, I, even I, even, I even the two of us talk so much. This could go on for days. But um, I even wrote in my essay that like it's a back to the misperceptions of you. But you're the most loyal and generous and kind-hearted person among the most I've ever met in my entire life. So. People should know that, and that's not calling you a maybe, 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 in the grand scheme of things, the fact that people deride me and have the wrong opinion of me is actually quite good because it protects me. Because it also means you're touching a nerve with people, and you know, I don't know. I always think it's good to polarize people. Speaking from my own, exp I don't know. It just means that people are aware of you and have an opinion. It doesn't really matter, and obviously. It doesn't affect you, which is the most important thing. Seriously, you know, some, sometimes, you know, I've been very opinionated on something and really? I've been wrong. That's so yeah. surprising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I've been wrong. And when I'm wrong, I'm, I, or I change my mind because of situations or circumstances. And I've straight away, I go, I, I was wrong. I apologize or, or whatever the situation is. So I'm not sort of like going around looking for a fight or or, you know, I'm really open to everything and I want to learn. And when you're young, you make a lot of mistakes because it's all about learning. And I made very big mistakes because at the same time, I did made and did very good big things. So as you do a good I'm big old thing- and I'm, I'm old and I'm still making mistakes every day. So hopefully things will improve in the years to come before it's too late, but I mean, I think- Yeah, but we should do Failure yeah, is a good listen, thing. If you're, mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're a creative person, so there's industries, okay? If you're a banker, you cannot fail. If you fail in banking, you pull everybody down. You mustn't make mistakes. You're a pilot, you maybe, not in banking. Yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> a banker, mathematician, whatever you want, right? A, a surgeon, okay? Surgeon cannot be creative and make mistakes, right? A surgeon has to get it right. Now, an, <laughs> an artist, the more failures and mistakes that you have as you create, the more you're going to learn. So you take Picasso, for example, he'd made some really bad work in between all the good work. And if he hadn't made the really bad work, he wouldn't, wouldn't have been Picasso. He wouldn't have, it, his courage in not actually resting on his laurels pushed him through. So as an artist, you have to make mistakes. You have to be open to mistakes and failures. And if you're sincere and genuine, they usually coincide with your life as well. Okay. Speaking about mistakes, <laughs> what do you think about like how what would, what do you think about Charles Saatchi back in the nineties and in the eighties? So, uh, so I wouldn't sell any work to Charles at all. So I, whenever I showed work, all the galleries had to know wherever it was that Charles Saatchi couldn't buy my work. Didn't Why? matter what he's. Why? Well, because he put Margaret Thatcher into power. 
So I was very much against Thatcher, Thatcher ideas actually. And so I didn't want my work going into the collection of someone who'd done all the ca campaigns for Thatcher. And then I was in a room with Margaret Thatcher and I thought that if I was in a room with Margaret Thatcher that I'd probably like challenge her or say something or do something. And I just looked at her and I thought, oh my God, she's just like a wizened up old crow, you know? I felt sorry for her. And I thought, do nothing. But what I did do was I went home and telephoned Charles Saatchi, Charles, the gallery, and said, tell Charles to give me a call. And, and they did, and I sold my bed. So, and then Charles wouldn't give me the money for my bed until he, what, he wanted to meet me. And I met him down Cork Street and he said, I want to know why you wouldn't sell me your work before and why now? And I said to him, I said, will you put Thatcher, I said, into power? And he said, my girl, he said, I'll do ads for tampons and Kit Kat. And I said, well, you should have stuck to it. I said, I said, you should have stuck to it. It's more honorable. <laughs> and from that moment, we got on like a house on fire. So there you go. So I always got on really well with Charles. He was always really good with my work. He's always respected my work. He always told me when he was going to put it into auction. He always asked my advice about it. And he only relinquished the last of it recently. He held on to it for a really long time. So and what do you think uh, about now? What, I mean, now he's evaporated from the art world. It's a shame. Well, can I tell you, yeah, no, but can I tell you something? Charles Sarchi, thank you, gave me the money so I could get a deposit from my first house. So all of these people that slag off Charles, you know, maybe they should just hand their keys back to him. You know, he did a lot of people, a lot of favours back then, supported a lot of galleries, a lot of artists, and, and you know, I'm not going to slag, I'm not going to, I'm not going to slag him off because I've got no reason to whatsoever. And he's always been really, I mean, no, I, I just think it's a shame that he's not as involved to the extent he used to be. Yeah, it is a shame. I think stuff. he might have felt jaded by it all. I, I don't know. Are you but, still in contact with him or no? Hmm? Are you Am still, I still in contact with him? Uh, yeah. Yes, I'm still. He, he wrote to me when, when uh, to, uh, to get well and stuff like that. And I saw his daughter the other week. She's opened a gallery. I see. So, yeah. so we can make fun of her. <laughs> no. Will you speak badly about her then? If you won't speak badly, I'm just kidding. So I next can question. Ask you a few stupid questions. You can ask me some stupid questions. Some more, yeah. Go on. And some more. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I think I've been doing a pretty admirable job thus far, if I may say. But okay, characterize my questions as stupid. Do you have a favorite color? Yes, blue. Really? What shade yes. of blue? Um, I love um, blue, petrol blue, um, uh, Prussian blue. Uh, I used to really like turquoise blue, but I don't so much anymore because I don't hang out in the Mediterranean all the time. Um, I like, um, yeah, that's a lot of blues. What about food? Um, I like caviar. What kind of food do I like or do I like food? What kind of food do you like? Um, I like caviar, I like cozy food, I like, uh, I like fruit salad, I like... <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on. Um, you have this unbelievable show coming up with you and Mr. Monk at the Royal Academy, which opens just in a week, oh, two weeks. How did you, when did you first become interested in his work and how did that show come about? Um, well, I've liked Monk since I was about 17. And um, in fact, I was quite in love with him, really. I wrote my, the my art thesis at, at college on him, My Man Monk, it was called. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I just wrote all these stories about him. I just made them all up kind of thing. And... Um, yeah, and I've always been obsessed by his work. I used to do versions of his work and everything. And then um, uh, Carrie, the curator at the Monk Museum, she's liked my work since the mid, uh, since 1997. And she thought that I would, it would work well, me and Monk doing a show. 
But when she came up with that idea, she had no idea about what a monk aficionado I was. Maybe. So it's brilliant. Nice. Was it three years, Harry? Yeah. Over the last three years, we've had complete access to the Monk Archive, which I've wow. absolutely loved and it, um, really made the most of it as well. What's some Studied of the greatest things that you uh, discovered in the archive? Um, monk's hats, Monk's paintbrushes, Monk's sofa. Um, and it was really brilliant. When we went into where all his furniture and bits and pieces and things were, it was this box and I opened up the box like that. And this is the God's truth. The hat moved inside the box. Ooh. And we all went, ah, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then this is really good. In the Monk Museum, it's, it's like, um, it's underground, a lot of the storage. And so all the doors are like bank vault doors and they're really heavy, like submarine doors. So the door was open and guess what? The door closed. Absolutely impossible for it to close on its own. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that mean? Was he watching over me? He's watching over me, yeah. He's like, there's my Tracy. She's come to take me out of all of this gloom. She's going to take me to the Royal Academy and show with me. And yeah. you behaved yourself and you didn't get into a fight with him or anything. No, I haven't. And the other thing about Monk is I'd never let him go. And you know, like when you're really in love with an artist when you're young, when you when you get into a certain age, you sort of go, oh, it's a bit embarrassing. You know, I, you know, I, I like, I like Solar Wit now or something. Well, I didn't. I carried on loving Monk all the way through. So a lot of my peers and contemporaries were totally bound up with what was happening. They were in love with, you know, wanking over Jeff Coons. And I was like, yeah, mad thank you for love. That hideous thought in my head, by the way. You know Sorry. what I mean? They were, besotted. <laughs> they were besotted by what was happening in America at a parallel, the same time as when, you know, whatever. And I wasn't. I was obsessed with what was happening in Europe in, in 1900. Mm -hmm. And it made me a bit different from my contemporaries. <laughs> yeah. I say that really harsh contemporaries here. <laughs> Sorry. What's that? I didn't hear you. Well, it doesn't matter. I said contemporaries. No, go on. Carry on. Go on. Oh, it's funny about Monk because uh, five years ago, when my youngest kid got by Mitzford, <laughs> before Skepta, the grime singer, was broke out, he he sang at my kid's bar mitzvah. And a few last year, he called me. He sent me a text message and he said he would like to buy the screen. So I said. Well, I have news for you. The last one sold for 120 million, and there are actually four. And he was a little bit, uh, he wasn't too amused. He wasn't terribly happy about the fact that he couldn't buy himself a screen since it was a little bit out of his uh, price range, even since he's become more successful. It's the, same, it's the same price as a super yacht. Yeah. Hmm. 120 million. Hmm. That's what people want to spend their money on. Uh, okay, just a little. Do you follow the work of other artists and do you collect the work of other artists or trade or, and then I'm finished. Uh, no, I, oh, you haven't finished yet. I haven't um, finished. That's the last question. Right. Is that your last question? Is that not enough? It's almost an hour already. Lazy, lazy, lazy. Anyway, so. Look, um, I did my homework. Look at all these notes I made. Come on, lazy. I'm not lazy, 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 lazy at all. Maybe not as prolific as you, but whatever. You inspire me. Just answer so, the question and stop criticizing. Yes I, yes, I do follow other artists' work. And yes, I do buy their art. And last week, I bought two paintings by Celia Hempton. which mm -hmm. And she's got a show on in London. And it was really the best show that I've seen for a long, long time. I loved it. Very tiny gallery, I really tiny. She paints a lot of penises. <laughs> I bought a penis painting. I bought one, a red one. And um, what else did I buy? I bought a painting of a cow. And I really wanted to buy one of her um, Vesuvius paintings, but they're all gone. And um, I collect a lot of work by David Elfmed. And I collect work by, I've got a whole collection of ceramic things as well by all different artists. Was that a plug for Xavier, one of his artists? The great sculptor yeah, David Altman. Uh, Walter Sweenham, another one of Xavier's artists. There you yeah, go. Yeah, painting is so cool. I would like one too. Uh, 
No, but I've got, I've got over, how many works? 500 or something? I've got over 500 of work, 500 works by other artists. Amazing. Maybe we can curate a show yeah. with your work in some of your collection at some time. Yeah, but I'd, I'm, and well, I'm hoping to be able to um, install it and hang some of it up in Margate in my all new right. studio. I don't know, I, I forgot all about Margate. How silly. Yeah, so then I'm, I'm going to add on a new question. You're doing one of the most awe again, like, I don't know, there's so many different facets about your life and your body of work that are just really beyond. And you're creating not just a kind of static museum for yourself or foundation, I should say, but you're creating a space to live and work in, in Margate, which is like ginormous. And it's an incredible feat to go back to where you grew up and do something that will actually spill over and contribute to the community there in so many different ways. And can you want to talk a little bit about that before we take questions? Yeah, I, I grew up in Margate. And uh, for anyone that doesn't know on the other side of the world, Margate is a, a Victorian seaside town in England. And it was a fantastic place to grow up in lots of ways. Um, but I left there when I was 15 and went to live in London. And it was a bit wayward or whatever. And, but growing up in Margate, lots of things happened to me. I've got lots of experiences, good, bad. I had a very sort of kind of quite bad childhood in some ways. And, and all of this has fed into my work. So it kind of makes sense that I go back to Margate now and finish it all, finish where I started. And so like, I feel like as an artist, I've been all around the world. I've done so many things, been to so many places. And when my mum was dying, I'd drive down to Margate and there was this building that was for sale that I knew and Carl Friedman, asked me to look at it with him, like the idea of us buying it together. And he, he showed it to me, but I wasn't keen. I wasn't keen on going back to Margate at that point. And then when my mum was dying, literally dying, I drove into Margate and then I drove around this building three times. And I thought, what am I doing? Mum could actually be dying now and I'm driving around this building. And I thought, no, I've got to buy this building because when my mum dies, I've got nothing in Margate anymore, just memories. And I, I don't want to let it go. And there's a saying, and it really is about Margate. You can take the girl out of, um, you can take the girl out of Margate, but you can't take Margate out of the girl. And people say it about loads of different places in England, and it means that you're a bit rough, but it's really true about Margate. And also Margate is known as the last resort as well, and the knuckle of England. It's, and it has this really incredible weather there giant waves and it's really windy and it's really romantic and passionate and dirty and kind of sexy it's this it's it's a brilliant place and to work there it will just feed me and feed me and feed me because i've got all of these locked in memories of my childhood and all this darkness and all these things that i've got to get out before i before i die i've got to i've got to work at them and there was no better place than going right back to where it happened. And that's what I'm looking forward to doing. It's going to be really difficult, but it's going to be a challenge, but an amazing one. It's going into the darkest recesses of my mind in the place where lots of things happened. So I'm looking forward to that. I've also got um, the sea. I can swim every morning in the sea. Um, and the whole way that the studio is set up is if I want, I never have to go outside. I've got everything in one place. And also, we, I bought done this thing. I bought like what I call the houses, free Georgian houses, and, and I bought them really because they just join onto my studio. But I'm going to turn them into like um, a really well, have my archive there and have a lecture series, life drawing, just really nice things for local people. But not like an art school, just like very free and a very easy kind of way of doing it, so it's not stressful. And that's a good way of giving something back and just. What me and Carl have done in Margate, with, he's got Carl Friedman Gallery and the print works there, has just, they call it the artist quarter now, which is quite funny. Um, but it's making Margate like, you know, and we've got the Turner Centre, Turner Contemporary, lots of little galleries, cottage industries, it's fantastic for vintage and, and it's good. It's got really good energy. It's pioneering. Whereas in London, I find it too, it's it sucks all your energy and the noise as well is constant and for me being creative I need silence 
France, you haven't talked about. So I need, I need silence. I need to have my thoughts in my mind. And in Margate, I'll be able to get that and also be able to have some kind of exorcism of the things that are trapped in my mind, the silt that's trapped in my mind. It will be forced out. You can have an exorcism ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> with a priest and a whole, anyway. Well, okay, so we should take, I just want to say, I'm, I'm so honored to be able to be in this position to sit with such great people that have listened through this. And Xavier and you, I just respect all of you so enormously. And I feel punching above my weight a little bit, sitting in this chair, speaking to you. Um, and I just want to thank well, I, you. I've got to say, I was quite nervous because I thought you were going to be really, really tough on me. But you haven't been, so it's good. No. Why? I would, that's not, no. I'm a pussycat. And so are you, against all popular uh, notions and beliefs. Okay, let's hear, maybe the questions we'll get are going to be hideous. Yeah, maybe that would be really nasty, yeah. Why are you such a cunt? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Thank you, Tracy and Kenny. We'll, um, we'll open the floor for questions now. Anybody who hasn't sent in questions, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, the first one is from Matthew Joseph Tinkler. Um, I've asked you to unmute yourself. If you can unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Hey, Tracy, uh, Radiohead or The Beatles? Oh, The Beatles. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm older than you. I'm like 30 years older than you, so it's fine. <laughs> Relax. Um, and the next question is, I think, from someone you're uh, familiar with, um, Javier Aparicio. If you can unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm really good, thanks. Are you in Ibiza? Um, no, I'm in um, the countryside in Madrid. Ah, Madrid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have uh, three questions and I don't know which one I should ask. Um, maybe, what does, how does the meaning of death has changed for you after all the cancer situation? Um, Well, I wasn't scared of it anyway, but I'm really not scared of it now. Really, really not. I'm, I'm not asking for it, perhaps would, but I'm not scared of it. And I am really want to concentrate on living a lot more. And, and I've got to, and also I'm not as, as, I'm not as afraid of anything. I was, I realized I was much more afraid before. I'm not now. I feel much more myself. I feel much more relaxed with myself, happier. I've never been so happy. This is like, I'm scared to say it, because actually I said that just before I found out I had cancer. So uh, um, I feel like my life's exciting, things are happening, and I'm also taking things that are given to me, taking the opportunity, whereas before I might turn my back on opportunity, which is spoil and stupid, because there's only one life, and you should do what you have to do or want to do when it comes to you. So that has well, changed. Well, then, I, I, I agree with Kenny that... Um, during whole the process, I found you very brave and very inspiring, you know? It's like, how do you face something so, um, so difficult? And like going through the Instagram and, that's, and, and reading the emails was like, uh, yeah, this is, this is what you want life for, like to live it. So I said to, I said to my friend Cecily, right, Cecil Mouse, I said to her, I said, this is gonna sound really sick. I said, but it's like getting married. And she, and she said, oh, I know what you mean. I said, like, I've never been married, never will be married. I said, but it's like this culmination of coming together, me and death. I said, it's like, you know, I'll just go towards it and it will come kind of thing. And, and the cancer, it's like all my friends being really nice to me. <laughs> and then some, my friend Amanda, she said to me, she said to me, when I first told her, she said to me, are you going to keep quiet about this? Just like not tell anyone. I went, no fucking way, I'm going to tell everyone. I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to get everything I can, you know. And I, you know, I just like, I just didn't let it, let it 
I wasn't going to let that rule my mind. It just wasn't going to. If anything, I'm talking about it much more now. I'm being much more cancery than I was because it's like it's like I was in a really bad car crash a few years, ago, really really terrible, and the car was I wasn't driving. I was asleep in the car with the with the front seat completely flat, and I was like asleep. And I woke up and the car and the person driving was shaking, and I saw a bit of the front wheel come off like the tire, and we and I just said to hold the car, hold the car, and we were screaming, and the car spun around, and we went into the crash barrier on the motorway, and there was a big juggernaut lorry that Jack knifed in. It was really, really terrible. The car was a complete write-off. It was just, and then the airbags had gone off, and it was smoke and everything, and the person in the back of the car, because I'd screamed at them, put your seatbelt on, as we were, and luckily I'd put my seat up as well, because laying about down flat, I would have probably broke my back or something, mm -hmm. you know, and all of this was in like 10 seconds thinking like this and then as soon as we crashed into the, I went right everybody out the car out the car and the person driving they couldn't open the door and I said to it through my door now and then we got out and then of course everyone was looking at us and I said to the others like even though it was my car <laughs> I'm gonna go and I saw a taxi and I the taxi stopped and I went home and people said to me, how on earth did you like think of stopping a taxi at that time? I said, because I had to get home. That's what you do. And it's like with little things in life, I'll make a real mess of them. Re really, I can scream about someone stacking the fridge wrong, you know, really scream. But something like cancer, something like my mum dying, something like a really bad car crash, I'm going to just deal with it because you have no choice but to deal with it. None. It's yeah. like, like, you know, there's millions of examples where you just have to get, you know, you fall off the boat, you swim. That's what, or you drown. That's what, that's what you have to do. You have no other choice. So I wasn't brave. I wasn't being brave. I was doing what I think you should do. Okay. What anyone should do. Hmm. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Good question. Yeah. Thank you, Kavi. <laughs> Next question is from Austin Wiener. Um, I've asked to you unmute yourself. Yeah. I am here. <laughs> Sorry, I broke my video. So I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you ask your question, please? Uh, yeah. So the question is the tent. It was that the hardest work for you to put out there in regards to the proximity of sort of revealing it all and having to mute the idea of the backlash of what that would do or feel like? <laughs> no, because in 1995, nobody knew who I was. I was completely unknown artist. I had only been in one show and that was with uh, Jay Joplin at the, um, at the Baby White Cube. And uh, this was a, a show at the South London Gallery, which my boyfriend at the time, Carl, curated. Mm -hmm. Carl, was, Carl curated this show called Minky Mankey. Basically, there was like Sarah Lucas, Damien, Gary Hume, Gilbert and George, like this British art. And Carl said that I couldn't be in it because it would look patronizing for him to put his girlfriend in, and especially as my work was really tiny and little and whatever. And he said to me, if you can make some big work, you can be in it. And I made my tent with the names of everybody that I'd ever slept. And I said to Carl, is that big enough for you? Which it was. And um, basically the tent was not about sex. The tent was about intimacy, about love, about rape. It was even about abortion because I, I put the, the feet, I said fetus one and fetus two. My grandmother whose hand, I lay in bed with her and hold her hand and listen to the radio. And it was like every everybody I could think of that I'd slept with, and I think there was there was 102 names, 35 of them I'd had sex with, uh, but not not full penetrative sex necessarily. And um, and I swear to God, right, I made this tent in my little tiny co-op flat in Waterloo, and the tent fitted in the whole of the living room, and it took me about four or five months to make and I spent the whole time inside the tent 
put my little portable TV in the tent. I ate inside the tent. I was sewing inside the tent. And the tent kind of smelled of like me and the food and all that kind of thing. And it was very warm in there. It wasn't at all like what, how people imagine it. And one of the best stories about the tent was my, when it was shown at Minky Mankey, people were queuing to go in it. And I was with my mum. And so my mum queued. And then my mum went in the tent when she, when she came out. I'm not going to say what the name was. But she said, I always knew that mm, 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 was a complete bastard. And there was this story about this guy who held my, who made me give him, I was only 13 or whatever, and he'd made me give him a blowjob. And then he'd held, and I didn't want to, and I was really didn't want to do it. And he, and I said, this is hell. And he grabbed hold of me by the hair, pulled me down the stairs by my hair, and he held my face about an inch away from the fire, a real fire, and he said, that's hell. That's what hell feels like. So that was my story to go with him in the tent. And so when you think about, and you know, when you think about how much that tent was ridiculed, uh, uh, um, you know, to do with like, like all these jokes about it and everything was essentially what I was writing about was like being, being a girl, being a woman, growing up, death, life, rape, abuse, everything, all within this capsule of this tent. It was pretty phenomenal. And nobody knew who I was. I wasn't well known. It was only when I made the tent that I got actually a little bit actually before when I showed with Jay. But the tent just made it, it went crazy. It went mad. And so, of course, then everybody was coming down reading to see whose names were in the tent. And that's when I didn't get in any trouble with anybody because anybody's name that shouldn't have been in that tent, they were not going to start shouting and screaming about it, were they? And there were some people who, um, you know, fucked me when I was like 14 or 15 or 13, and they weren't going to make it, didn't matter what I said about them, they weren't going to make any noise about it, because if they did, they were going to be in big trouble, weren't they? So I, I, I managed to do it. But when the tent got burnt, I was really upset about it. But um, it, it I thought, phew, thank God for that. <laughs> it's kind of gone. You know, it was sad and everything, but it seemed to, to make sense. And it was also, I always said, like a phoenix rising because then I started making, started painting again and making lots of other work. So, um, yeah, and, and so it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't so bad. And then people said, would I make another tent? And I couldn't now. God, I haven't got enough, there's no name. I couldn't, I haven't got enough names to fill a tent. It would be absolutely impossible. So, but it'd be a lot more famous ones on it, I reckon. So, <laughs> yeah. thank you, Tracy. That that tent changed my life, and I think a lot of other artists, specifically females, as well. So, thank you for that. Thank you very much, Austin. You should, you should. Hello, you should check out Austin's work. She's a fabulous painter. Oh, I will. Just had a yeah. show in London. I'm not sure if it's is it still up, Austin. She has a show that's up now at. Carl Costello Gallery. It is okay. still up. It's up for another week. So if you feel like venturing, Tracy, more than welcome. Well, Harry's Googling it right now. <laughs> Here you go. A little plug for my friend Austin, who I really care for. Oh, love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is from Russ Tovey. Um, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm unmuted. What's that image? Oh, it's you, Russ. Hello. Yeah. No, I don't. Um, you, someone mute him. Someone mute that guy. <laughs> someone get him off. Get him off. <laughs> are, you, are you over all your stardom from being on telly last night? It's on tonight as well at nine o'clock. It's on four nights in a row. So That's yet. why he's speaking. He's giving himself a plug before his show. Yeah. Russ got no question. He's just come on. How many people are watching this? Russ just wants to tell everyone nine o'clock's night. Sister, what's it called? ITV. Yeah. Just the sister. <laughs> Um, uh, so outside of art, other cultural things, like what is your favorite pastime for yourself? Ooh. Harry said He's I should say Harry. He's looking at Harry for a lifeline. Oh, <laughs> uh, what do I like doing? Hmm. Oh, I know. Houses. Houses. What, what, what sort of thing with houses? Property. Property. That's what I like. Yeah. I like, I like renovating, building, whatever. Sometimes it drives me mad, but I've done a lot of it. So, yeah. 
So I built my studio, I built Margate now, I, you know, whether it's continuous. So that's what I, that's a love that I love doing. I like, I like building nest homes nest making i love that kind of thing people wouldn't imagine it about me but i do i like i like things being beautiful and aesthetic and everything so there's that and swimming but of course i haven't done much of that but now more than swimming i like riding my bike in the water i've got a water bike and um i don't know i i thought all right when i interview people for jobs at my studio one of the questions i ask them is what's your hobbies and the more elaborate and amazing their hobbies are, the more chance they got of having a job. If mm. they were to ask me what the question was, I, I, what's your hobby? I, I, I haven't got one really, to be honest, because my, all my spare time when I'm feeling energized and good is going to be spent making art. You know, it's not, a, it's a vocation. What I do is, that's all I do. It's all I've ever done. I've never done anything else ever. I was broke for 10 years. I had absolutely no money at all, none. And, and all I did was made, made art. So when I had some money, I'd go and buy some paints and materials or whatever. I'd never, you know, uh, I'd drink and smoke too, if I could. But um, no, I have, I have very few hobbies now. Well, it's a no. top tip for anyone coming to your studio for a job. Just come up with the biggest, most elaborate <laughs> hobby and you'll get the job. <laughs> <laughs> the person who worked for me for 14 years, her hobby was ice dancing. So they <laughs> used to get up at five in the morning to go ice dancing twice a week. So to beat that mm. next employee. Yeah. Mm. No, I like doing nice things. I like picnics, for example. There you go. What's your hobbies, Russ? Oh, God. Uh... Acting. Acting, yeah, it's a hobby. <laughs> Definitely a hobby. Nice pastime. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you're right, Kenny. I guess art is my um, thing. It's my thing that I'm obsessed with. And the gym. Well, mine, mine is too. Yeah. Mine is too. Yeah. Definitely. Cats. Cats and mm. dogs. Yeah. So, nice question, Russ. Thanks, Trace. Right at nine o'clock on ITV, the sister. Yeah. <laughs> you get that? Listen to his talk art podcast, of which both Tracy and I were guests on. Exactly. So yeah. instead of watching the show, just look up talk art and listen to these amazing yeah. with Robert Demon, and you can see some incredible interviews with artists, which is probably among the most um, listened to podcast about art there is today. Yeah, it's millions. Millions. And we got a book yeah. deal, which is pre-order on Amazon now, if you want. All right, Russ. <laughs> <Not me. laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions. Uh, one more from uh, Cecily Bates. Uh, if you could unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I wanted to ask, um, when you paint, do you paint with your mind or your body? What comes first for you? Being in an Eve Klein kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have done Eve Kleins. I did a series of Klein prints with my body in 1996, and they were really good. And they're in my room. Um, Exorcism, the last painting I ever made. They're good. But um, yeah, when, when I paint, I think I paint with every single bit of me. I think I paint with my everything and it's not my mind. So one thing is I don't sit down and work out how I'm going to make a painting ever. I couldn't do that. It would just be too boring. And I don't, I'm not into mark making either. So I don't make marks. I just, that's why I can't paint at the moment because I've I'm, I'm got no muscle at all left. It's been eaten away. And but when I'm stronger, I'm going to, I want to go back. I think it's like being a sort of like a conductor or something or being in a kind of like a whirling dervish or a kind of, I don't know, just going mad and doing it with the paint. And I'm really looking forward to doing it in Margate because in Margate, I can go crazy and mad on 40 canvases at once. And, and I might not like it, I might like it, but it will be just the like action painting. 
So there's, there's the body bit. And then afterwards, I look at the shapes and things and think, what does that look like? What is that? What can I use? Where is it? What's happening? And sometimes with the paintings I write underneath, I write things that I don't want anyone to read or see, and only I know that what they're there. And then sometimes bits of the word come through, and someone will say, a gallerist will say, Tracy, what does it say underneath? And I say, I haven't got a clue. I don't know. I don't remember anymore. So um, the paintings are like a, it's like a, a, a code that has to be cracked. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to make a picture that's definitely what i'm not trying to do because if i was making a picture i can make hundreds thousands of paintings just i could paint non-stop all day long because i have so many pictures in my mind even or i could just paint what i see i could paint the teapot the cup you know they'd like it they but i wouldn't and that's why I paint over lots of my paintings because there's a kind of formula to what you do. And once you've got it, you have this formula, like the figure with the raised leg, which I'm really good at. And now that figure is just to get me using the paint, to get me on the canvas. And sometimes I do these really beautiful paintings of like this reclining figure. And I know there's a whole bloody waiting list for them, but I'm, not, I'm just going to get rid of it because it's, it's no good. It's not telling me anything I don't know. Definitely, definitely like it's kind of quite. I want it to tell me something. What's that sound? Effect? What's that sound that makes? <laughs> my sound effects. No, my sound effects are painting. No, but the um, but this is the painting that I was talking about when I got the phone call to say that I had cancer. Is this sort of like red, strange painting with this sort of big black mess over it, kind of thing? And when I saw the scan. From my, from my bladder, from the cancer, it is identical to this red painting that I did. Identical. It was like, it's like a map. It's just like, that's what I painted. So, and that's before I knew I had the cancer, before I knew I had the bladder cancer. So what I was sitting there and staring at, wondering what it was when I got that phone call, was what was inside me. It's very interesting. And the reason why I couldn't work out what to do with it or what it was, it's because it was finished. It was a fucking great big tumour in my bladder. That's what I painted. Which is really interesting because it just shows that it's like, it's a force. I've always said this about drawing. It comes through you. It goes through your heart. It goes through all of you and it comes through your hands. It's this energy stuff. It's like splitting an atom or something. It's dangerous. Everyone's gone quiet. Hello? What are you doing? I thought you'd have frozen. Sorry. How's it going? <laughs> the next question is coming from Dorothy Prigvat. Uh, if you could please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi, Tracy. Um, uh, I've been really impressed actually by, by all the collaborations you've made with, with charities and you've had actually uh, an amazing lithograph produced actually during the lockdown, uh, collaborating actually with women charities. Not many artists do that, uh, and I found that very moving. Just would like to, to know whether you're planning other collaborations, and that's something which is close to your heart as well. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I just, artists are very generous. A lot of artists work and do a lot of work for charity and they, and they donate a lot for auctions for charities. And if anything, we kind of do it too much, really. And But um, I feel like the, the women's charity that you're referring to is um, Oasis in Margate, and it's for safe houses for abused women. So that's Margate, and it's, it's, it's a small charity, so it's really good. You do, I do something like do a lithograph, and it's with Carl Friedman, and it sells out. That's really helped that charity. It's really, really brilliant. So um, it's, it's a nice feeling to be able to help. Your art, my art can help people. It's brilliant. It doesn't just help me. It just, doesn't just benefit me. Or it doesn't just benefit the people who look at it on the walls. It goes further than that. And, and also I feel that I've had, in, I'm so lucky to be able to do what I really want to do that I should maybe, put, I should push that luck further for other people. So it gives me pleasure doing it. So, yeah, cool, simple answer. 
Thank you. Uh, we'll have one more question uh, from Philip Klein, if you could unmute. Yes. Um, hello. <laughs> um, well, also, first of all, um, I admire you for being so open tonight and I wish you well and uh, recovery. Um, I actually have two questions, so feel free to just choose or answer both. Um, do you feel like you needed to go through everything um, that life threw at you and everything you had to make up till now to become the painter you are right now? And secondly, um, why did you choose David Chipperfield Architects as your architect and can you describe how you uh, work together? Okay, so I answer the second question quickly first. Yeah. David was going to do the extension to my studio in London, but we couldn't get planning permission. And I appealed against the council, Tower Hamlets, and we had an appeal coming up and it was a real battle. Then my mum died and I decided that I was too weak and too upset and in too much, I was grieving too much about my mum to take on this battle. So I just decided to forget it and not do it. So then, so David is not my architect, David Chiffield. And then his son Gabriel helped me in Margate. He did design the, my, did the sculpture studio. And so that was that, but I actually done all of Margate and finished Margate and um, I love architects. If I had a daughter, I would like her to be an architect. If I was really brainy and academic, I would have liked to have been an architect maybe, I don't know. But um, I will never, ever, ever, ever use another architect in my life because okay. um, I have all my own ideas. I know exactly what I want to do. And um, I can use an architectural engineer. So using an architectural engineer, I, this is what architects do as well. A lot of architects don't do architectural engineering and drawings. They just have ideas and someone else draws them up. I've got my own ideas. They can draw them up. So look, that's that one. And the other, the last question is, so let's say if I could have got rid of the abortions, if I could have got rid of the sexual abuse, if I could have got rid of being raped, if I could have got rid of the cancer, if I could have got rid of what rate, if I could have, I don't know, whatever. Would I be any happier? Would I be a better person? Would I be a better artist? Probably not. It is what it is. It's my life, isn't it? My journey. And someone, someone said something very mean about me, like as if I caught these things, you know, I follow them or something and I don't. I'm just like a really weird exceptional person that's just been given a lot to deal with in life and luckily i seem to have the tools to deal with them you know i'm, I'm okay i'm all right it's better that it's me than someone else that couldn't deal with it so i'm, I'm okay and that's the most important thing I'm, I'm really lucky i am a very lucky person and i really love what i do i love my art i love being creative art is my friend it cuddles me it keeps me warm i went to Antwerp once and I was very lonely and very sad and I went into the National Museum there and I was the only person in there and I was looking at the Rubens, looking at all these paintings and I felt okay because I knew where I was, I knew what I was doing and as an artist art will always keep me safe and keep me like feeling like I know who I am and I know what I'm doing and that's just a really wonderful feeling because it means I'll never be lost. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you very much, Tracy. I think that's a, a perfect note to end this talk on. Uh, Kenny, thank you very much for your for your interviews, for your beautiful essay, and Tracy uh, for your honesty. Um, I'll try to uh, unmute everybody so that everybody can say thank you and bye bye. As you, yours, 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 Tracy. I'm sorry, Tracy. Can I say thank you? Of course, yes, thank yes, yes. Thank yeah, thank you, Yoris, for doing all, and thank you, everyone, for helping, and thank you for the questions, and thank you, Kenny, especially as I, as I know how ill you are at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you so much for generous, good questions. Thank you, Xavier, and um, I really wish I could see my show. So, um, if you live in Brussels, I'll see you.
you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. 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 Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, 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 Tracy.